Well, let me go on to one final point regarding resources, that is partnerships. Now, a lot of partnerships include short-term missions, but I'm speaking of partnerships in a bigger sense, a more extended relationship uh, where uh, there's a longer-term agreement of some kind of a joint venture in the partnership. So not just a single team coming now or coming again, but a larger kind of relationship. Now, there are many different kinds of partnerships. Uh, there are partnerships between a foreign mission agency and a national church or denomination. That will look one way. Maybe between foreign missionaries and a local national congregation. Between a church in one country and a church or church plant in another country. And that's really the main type that I want to talk about is partnerships with a church plant. There's partnerships between expatriate missionaries from different countries. Nowadays, we're seeing more and more there may be a church plan or mission team where there's one American, there's one uh, uh, German, there's one Korean, and there's one from Singapore. You may have these multinational teams that are going to plan a church. Of course, they have a whole dynamic of their own. So there's a lot of different kinds of partnerships, and you can probably name some more. But I want to focus in church planting partnerships particularly where there may be an expatriate congregation or a, say it's an American church or a European church that says, we want to help you plant your church wherever you are. And we want to have a direct partnership. We call these so congregational direct or congregation to congregation partnerships. So there's a church somewhere that says, we're going to be sort of like your sister congregation and help with this church plant. So what are some of the things that are going to be important to know about how to do this well, because this is also happening more and more all the time. Well, first of all, partnerships are complicated. They're complicated because you've got usually people coming from different cultures with all kinds of different expectations. You've got, you've got different cultures, okay. You've got different expectations. You've got different resources. The partner church on one side probably has more resources they're going to contribute. You've got maybe different languages, maybe different goals. What, what you feel is important to accomplish with that church plant, the other partner, they, they think it should look different. Accountability, we've already talked about that. Uh, how tightly controlled is the accountability? Uh, do we have to uh, agree on every decision that's made and the way every dollar is spent? Planning. Well, some cultures are very flexible in the way they look at plans. We make a plan, but that plan is just our momentary idea of what we want to do. But next week there's a new circumstance. Well, we don't worry about the plan that much. We flex with the realities. Other cultures, make, they make plans and they expect those plans to be like in concrete. I mean, you just don't change your plan. Uh, we're going to stay with that plan, right? No matter what, you know, even if it doesn't apply anymore. So there's very different ideas about how do you plan? How do you make decisions? Is the one church making all the decisions and the other church is not making any? But then how do you negotiate how you're going to plan? Trust. Is there really trust between these two groups? Or is there a little bit of suspicion you know, if we don't watch them closely, they're going to do something we don't want to do. Hospitality. There's even different understandings of what it means to be hospitable. Uh, many cultures have a high value on hospitality. And, and so if, some, if a group comes from the outside, there's a, a moral obligation to lavishly provide for in hospitality, something that the people can't really maybe afford very well, but that's a value to them. Others have different understandings of that. Change, the unexpected, how do we deal with change? Inexperience. We've never done this kind of partnership before. Now what do we do? Money. How do we use money? And what's the best way to use money? How do you account for money? Theology. How many more do I need to name here? All the potential areas where there can be conflict and confusion in these partnerships. Theology. The church, one church has a very strong theology that goes this way. The church plant, well, maybe we're not as strict on that point. And we have different ideas of behavioral modes of conduct and all the rest. Programs, surprises that you didn't expect to come along the way, power issues, who's got the power, who's making the decisions, and tradition. 
Many cultures have a high value on tradition, and we need to carry on our church tradition. Other cultures put a high value on creativity. You got to do it different. You got to do something new. Don't just do what's always been done. All these things need to be negotiated. The nature of friendship, loyalty, conflict, risk, fun. Especially American groups, got to have fun, right? If it's not fun, that's not a very good partnership. Okay, so partnerships are complicated. And uh, you have to go into a partnership with very, very open eyes that there's going to be a lot of potential for confusion, conflict, misunderstanding. That doesn't mean good things can't happen. Good things do happen in spite of all this. But effective partnerships are alert to cultural differences. We're not going to underestimate that. And as we were talking in the break, it's going to be a real key to having a bicultural mediator in a partnership. A bicultural mediator is somebody who understands both cultures well and has a somewhat neutral position in the partnership. In other words, that bicultural person is probably not a member of this church or that church. That bicultural person can bridge those cultural differences. So sometimes there's a misunderstanding or a conflict that arises. It's, it's really just a misunderstanding. And this bicultural person says, well, you know, I've learned to think the way a Russian thinks. And so he'll say maybe to that American group, okay, look, this is what the Russians are kind of thinking. This is what they mean by that. And this is the way their culture works. You need to understand that. He knows how to explain that maybe to the American. And then vice versa. Then he goes over to the Russian side and says, now there's one thing you got to know about Americans, and that's like this. And so you can kind of bridge and mediate those cultural differences. If you have that kind of person, it makes a world of difference. Because otherwise, you've just got these groups that may not be understanding each other and having a hard time negotiating that. A good, effective partnership has to be based on mutual respect. There's a natural tendency for the church with more resources to think that somehow they're better, or somehow they're smarter, or somehow they've got more answers than the church or the church plant that has less resources. And that's not a good attitude to be entering in. They may have more money. doesn't mean that they shouldn't have equal respect for one another. Every partner should be bringing something into this relationship for which we can respect each other. One may have more financial resources, the other may have other spiritual or human resources that are just as important. Effective partnerships clarify by what they mean by the word partnership. Um, this word partnership translates even into different languages differently. And uh, I'm using the English word partnership. Now, that could mean something very different when it goes into another language. They're not thinking the same terms of what I'm thinking when I say partnership. And we've run into these kinds of problems in more than one case. Is a partnership primarily a business partnership? You see, businesses come together for partnerships, usually for one reason, to make more money, right? They've got a project they're working on, and so it's very businesslike. We've got a goal, we want to sell more widgets or whatever their business is about, and they're going to come together and they'll accomplish that goal. Often, once that goal is achieved, the partnership may dissolve uh, because it's really just about accomplishing that task. Now. For good or for bad, that is the way many Westerners, many Americans will enter a partnership. They're thinking about achieving a task. And so it will sound something like this. I'm from church XYZ and we want to help you plan a church. For, so for five years, we will help you in this and this way. And in, at the end of five years, you will have planted the church. We will both have accomplished the goal and the partnership will end. That's sort of a business-like way of having a partnership. You define the goals, you define exactly who's going to bring what resources, it's all spelled out, and once you've accomplished the goal, you're, you're kind of done. Then you see if it's going to, you're going to do something else. That's a business sort of relationship. 
Some people look at the partnership as what we would call a patron-client relationship. And what that means is the patron is sort of the father figure who sort of starts up this project. And then the client is sort of like the person who serves the project. The patron remains in control. The patron remains primarily responsible. And the client is responsible to provide the services. It's sort of the ground level. And it's not an equal relationship at all. There's sort of a symbiosis because the patron needs the client to do the work. The client needs the patron to sort of manage it and, and provide the oversight, but it's not an equal relationship. Now, if I come into that relationship thinking business relationship, the other person's thinking patron-client, that's going to be very different. Because what's going to happen? Every time we're lacking something, the client comes back to the patron and says, hey, we need more resources, or hey, you've got to do this, or hey, you've got to fix this problem because the patron's primarily responsible, not the client. Now, a lot of people will come into, in certain cultures, they'll come into that partnership with that kind of expectation. That needs to be clarified. And in some cultures, if you started it, you finish it. <laughs> so in other words, if that outside church says, well, we'll help plant your church, and then we'll say, okay, well, we'll be the people who, who plant the church on the ground. We're the, we're the Russians or we're the, the uh, Africans, whatever. Uh, we'll plant that. You, you start, with, but you start it, you finish it. So if at the end of the five years, it's not planted, so wait a minute, you start it, you got to finish it. You got to finish it. We're just sort of helping carry out the thing. You kind of, you bought it, you own it. And uh, that's, that can lead to all kinds of problems. Then there's those people who look at the partnership as sort of an extended family relationship. And particularly in collectivistic cultures, extended family is very important. Um, in Western cultures, we tend to think of what we call the nuclear family. Father, mother, children, maybe grandparents, but it's a small family. In more collectivistic cultures, of course, you have the extended family. You have aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents and so on nieces, nephews, and so you've had this larger collective. And in that larger collective, that is sort of your form of security, especially in countries where you don't have a lot of social security, you don't have a lot of insurance policies or health care. Your extended family is kind of your security system. It's your safety net. Things go wrong. You depend on other members of your extended family to help you. And so uh, some will look at this partnership as sort of this extended family relationship. So that church that wants to partner with this church plant. Well, you're, you're sort of like our extended cousins out there. And so you're there for us when we have a need, right? Because that's what extended family do. That's bad if your extended family doesn't help you when you have a need. So maybe this church plant's going along and there's a need that arises. And you look to that extended, that's the rich uncle, so to speak, in America, and you say, hey, you got to help us here. And they say, well, wait a minute, we didn't, that wasn't part of the agreement. You go, agreement? Extended families, wait a minute, our extended family doesn't have a written agreement, does it? We don't have that in the contract anywhere in the written agreement. Uncles are responsible to pay for medical bills of nephews. What are you talking about? See, the business relationship says, wait a minute, we have a piece of paper that says this is what we will do and this is what we don't do. That's what you do in business relationships, right? But in family relationships, do you do that? I suppose some teenagers wish they could do that and say, Mom, well, we got a contract. I'm allowed to do this. But family relationships, they're a matter of trust. They're a matter of mutual care. And even though it means sacrifice and you may not always want to, you got to be there for each other. Well, is that what they mean by partnership? Is that what I mean by partnership? Well, these are all the sort of hidden dangers and confusion that can arise that you really need to talk about so you're clear about it. And, and I'll tell you again, most American churches are thinking primarily, primarily in the business model. And so sometimes when they say, well, at the end of five years, we're done with the partnership and uh, we helped plant a church in the Ukraine and next year we're going to help plant a church in Italy. You go, what? We thought we were partners. And the other guy says, yeah, we were partners. Yeah, we finished our partnership. We're done. You know, but partner means family. 
You don't just say, well, raised my kid, sent him out of the house, goodbye, good riddance, we're not going to have a relationship anymore, do you? And so these expectations can also create heartbreak, and that's worthy of clarification on both sides of the equation. Good partnerships have mutually agreed upon means of accountability and decision making. Now that kind of relates to the previous point a little bit. We've already talked that different organizations, different cultures have different ways they keep accountable and the way decisions are going to be made. Um, a lot of partners don't like to be surprised by big decisions that they weren't a part of. Changes come along, sometimes decisions have to be made spontaneously, you have to respond to the situation. Uh, but you do need to have a clarification with your partner on either side, uh, what are the kinds of decisions we need to discuss together? And what is the level of freedom to just do what we think is right at the moment? Effective partnerships are honest and transparent. And this is a tricky thing because some cultures are such that you don't say negative things out loud. It would be impolite to say out loud, we have a problem here. You just don't say that to somebody, especially if they're your partner. That's, that's rude. It'd be offensive. Some cultures, if you don't say that, they'll assume there's no problem. And so what does it look like to be transparent? You're going to need to find ways to communicate clearly so that if there is a problem arising, it gets communicated in a way that the other understands. And here again, your bicultural mediator, your bridge person can help do that. And that bridge person may say, you know, there's a problem arising. The one says, what? I didn't hear. Nobody said anything about a problem. And they say, well, yeah, because that's because you're an American. But if you were listening with, with Chinese ears, you would have heard that there's a problem there. <laughs> and let me tell you about that. So sometimes that meteor will help keep the transparency level high. But you do need to deal with issues as they arise. And then seek to empower, if you're the one with more resources, seek to empower rather than dominate or condescend or create dependencies, what we've been talking about. On the flip side, don't allow yourself to be dominated by another partner who has more resources. Be true to what God's called your church to be. And if that means saying no to some resources you wish you had, you may need to just be bold enough to say, we need to follow what God's really led us to do, even if that means we have to say no to certain aspects of a partnership. A couple of resources to, um, if you want to deepen this, this uh, topic a little bit, there's a book by Mary Later Leitner called Cross-Cultural Partnerships. Good book on this topic that uh, will help navigate all these kinds of issues. And then there's another book called When Helping Hurts. And that book talks a lot about ways to use resources that empower and do not create dominance or um, uh, help that hurts. And so those are a couple of very helpful resources for you. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. Let me just conclude again with a few application questions for you to be thinking about what this means in your situation. In what ways can you encourage greater local ownership and stewardship of your ministry? How might short-term mission teams be best utilized in your church plant or your ministry? If you're in a partnership, where is there need for clarification about the nature of the relationship? So you can take these questions and look through the material again and consider uh, where there needs to be adjustment in your particular situation. Okay, well, we'll take a question then on this. You mentioned about uh, partnership and very good guidelines which are written in Lausanne standards. And I see there several times mentioned uh, the mutual accountability. Do you mean accountability in what? Spiritual part, practical part, finances? If it's finances, to what extent? Because I have seen several different 
uh, shorter missions. For example, one uh, mission team came to help to fix the houses for the orphans, and they been very cautious, very accurate, uh, and didn't spend much money. But by the way, on the way home, as they won't, were going to Moscow, they had a very huge, very expensive banquet. And nobody knows <laughs> what this money saved from the mission fund or what. Well, I think, again, these are the kind of things that are very sensitive and they need to be talked about in a way that both parties are comfortable with. In this case, again, on the one hand, if that group raised the money for their, their project and their trip, it's a little hard for another group to say, hey, you know, why are you spending the money that way? But usually where the conflict comes in is when the money is promised for something that is not given. That obviously creates a problem on the side of the receiving end and saying, hey, you know, you made a commitment and you're not fulfilling that. And so there's a recountability in that angle. Um, or when money is given and that money is not used for what it was given for. Those are usually the more sensitive issues when it comes to money. Um, and uh, the, other, the other thing is, is there accountability beyond just the, my financial? I think there is. Sometimes there's a doctrinal purity that's expected that, that a church represents um, a certain biblical stance on certain doctrinal positions. I think that's fair enough. Um, I'm not going to let a partner tell me what my doctrinal statement should be, but I think it's fair to expect that there's a certain doctrinal standard that is maintained once you've agreed upon that. I think that there may be a, a certain spiritual accountability. I'm thinking now if I'm this, the church plant that's receiving a team and they send a team of people who are quite frankly living in a way or behaving in a way that's not becoming of the gospel, I think there's an accountability in spirituality where I have a right to say, hey, you sent a team that really was not contributing spiritually and there's that kind of accountability too. So I do think the accountability goes both ways, not just financially one way. And I think it applies not just to finances, it can apply to spiritual things, it can apply, apply to commitments of, uh, of what, what this is going to look like. So there is a mutual accountability going on here. and. Uh, and then again, accountability in the way decisions are made. Um, if you can try and agree the kinds of decisions you want to collaborate on, uh, that will be helpful. So one group doesn't autonomously make a decision that the other group was, what? You know, we didn't know about that. Why did you decide that? So being open about those kind of issues. Thank you. Anything else on this? I'm sure somebody's got a really juicy story to tell about some short-term team that came through and did something really crazy. <laughs> you know where they re people really get into trouble is uh, in sexual mores. Gender relationships uh, is a big issue. How you wear clothing, how you touch. Some cultures are high-touch cultures. Some cultures are low-touch cultures. Uh, I mean, there are just so many areas like this that uh, can be a uh, real trouble. <laughs>